Our next speakers on the subject of India and Hindutva are Nitasha Kaul and Audrey Trushki. Nitasha Kaul is an Associate Professor of Politics and International Relations with the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster. She is a multidisciplinary academic, novelist, poet, artist, and economist who has researched and published extensively on themes relating to democracy, political economy, identity, rise of right-wing uh, nationalism, feminist and post-colonial critiques, Bhutan, India, and Kashmir. Audrey Treshke is an associate professor of South Asian history at Rutgers University, uh, Rutgers University, Newark, <laughs> and the director of Asian studies. She works on Hindu-Muslim interactions in pre-modern South Asia, as well as the politics of history and Hindutva in the present day. Uh, we look forward to your talks. Hi, uh, is it possible to, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you, Paula. So uh, I'm going to actually, in my short presentation, try and combine um, the the sort of the ideas that the previous two speakers have, uh, the standpoints that the previous two speakers have um, presented from, which is both a personal and an overview experience of what's going on in the Indian context. And, uh, and the Indian context is actually compared to many other countries that are overtly authoritarian, the transformation in India, which is, uh, you know, which is seen as a democracy, uh, often passes under the radar. So as, uh, so this, uh, so, so for me personally, as a uh, scholar who happens to write about politics and international relations, and specifically the rise of the global right and the transformation in India, as well as someone who originally is from Kashmir, a fact that's very apparent to people in South Asia from my surname, especially in India from my surname, and happens to be a woman, uh, I found over the years uh, and, and you know, have had to over the years deal with an incredible amount of hate from this online ecosystem and I've reacted differently at different times to it and it's sometimes just, just literally been off social media for, for months at a time. Um, so it's, it's not really a purely an academic uh, endeavor for me, nor can it be given my own positionality. So um, I think the I would so I would I would switch between these you know these two sorts of um, uh, points that I will be speaking from. In India, in 1925, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh was set up. This is a uh, right wing paramilitary that uh, that portrays itself as a social service organization, and it is the ideological parent of the current ruling uh, party, the Bharatiya Janata Party. Now, the, the RSS idea of Indian nationalism was never the secular developmental nationalism of the Nehruvian kind that the rest of the world is more familiar with. And, uh, and the RSS idea of India is as India as a Hindu nation, the, some of the most important figures of RSS were open admirers of Nazi party in Germany and saw India as this pure land of Hindus only. The BJP has the party, of course, comes much later, and it has had various phases, especially after 1991 when India liberalized, but also when there was a clear communalization, clear and explicit communalization of the discourse in India. And then the post-2014 period, since which the Modi regime in India, and I've in my other work argued, has, has worked in ways that have projected the myth of Modi as an ascetic, paternal, and efficient uh, figure. Uh, and, and it's a very carefully constructed uh, myth, and it works uh, politically uh, very powerfully, but also the use uh, as, as, a, as a strategy of, uh, of what I call a forked tongue speech, of speaking in deliberate and systematic contradictory ways, systematically contradictory ways to audiences that are national versus international, grassroots versus uh, corporate, and the idea, and, and also the idea of India, which is seen as an urban thing, and Bharat, which actually literally is just the Hindi version of the name, but is presented as a pure, uh, a pure primordial idyll of, of India. Now, in Hindutva, in this project of Hindutva, othering is very central, and uh, Muslims are seen as this prime other to the Indian, uh, to the Indian sort of the, the the normative Indian identity, the unmarked norm, as it were. And within this. The idea is to transform India, and this has been ongoing, to transform India as a society and polity 
to a situation where accessing anything is conditional upon a certain hierarchical basis of identity. Um, the Islamophobia in India works in, in, in a multidimensional way through looking at Pakistan as this existential other, Kashmiri Muslims as always latent terrorists, Indian Muslims as suspect citizens, and of course, refugees such as the Rohingya as, as pests like the Indian Home Minister referred to them. Uh, the, uh, the current home minister. Now, uh, the, this organized harassment that I personally have, have faced over years, uh, certainly over a decade, and especially when I first specifically started writing about Kashmir in non-communal terms as somebody who is not a Muslim but speaks uh, speaks across the divide, uh, it, it has it has it, it, it's it never gets easier. Firstly, there's that it never gets easier, and it's it's actually. Uh, a live and present threat. And it's also a very gendered mode of harassment. So as a woman, the harassment tends to be very typically along the lines of uh, not just death threats, but rape threats and very systematic attempts, including online to present, uh, to, to deliberately spread misinformation, not just about me, but, you know, but, but about women who speak up. Uh, in in uh, with with information that uh, including editing, for instance, Wikipedia entries and uh, and writing to to the employer or the university or to colleagues to say that this person is married to someone in the Pakistan embassy or or you know very very specific. Uh, deliberately uh, toxic, uh, fabricated lies. And the idea there, and, and of course, to continually present people like me, but also me as victims of love jihad. Uh, love jihad, to anyone who doesn't know, is this idea that, that women who are not Muslim, but who speak up in ways that apparently appease Muslims or speak for the human rights of all uh, must be controlled by some Muslim because Muslims prosecute jihad through multiple means, including through love, uh, but also through Corona, et cetera. So, so there's, there's, a, there's a whole kind of ecosystem of, of lies, uh, but also a very systematic vocabulary that the right-wing project in India has developed, such as the use of words like urban naxals, urban uh, as in people who dwell in cities, and naxalites referring to the insurgency uh, that, uh, that India has, has seen for several decades. And the idea of urban naxalites is to portray people who speak in, in public, public intellectuals and academics and others, as what are called intellectual terrorists who should therefore be dealt with in the same way as terrorists. There are uh, numerous cases of sedition, uh, um, uh, um, the, the labels of, of anti-nationalism that many of us have seen over the years in a very systematic way. Uh, there's, there's, um, there's and, and uh, to go back to something that was mentioned earlier, there is a link between the online and the offline, and this link is very systematic. So while I, as an academic, uh, you know, have have online harassment continuously that I have to I have to I have to face, uh, including at points when it gets very exacerbated. So in 2015, when I challenged the the ruling um, the the head of uh, the RSS on a, on an Al Jazeera uh, head to head episode, after that my life was literally. Uh, impossible to, uh, to, to it's, in, it's impossible to explain the amount of threats and hate that I got for a long time after that. Um, likewise, in 2019, when I provided congress a, a congressional testimony uh, as an expert on, on the issue of Kashmir, uh, when, when, the, when the autonomy of Kashmir was, was revoked overnight, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of that congressional testimony, I was subjected to intense and, and horrifying levels of abuse and threats specifically to my, to not just to me, but to my family in India, and, and uh, you know, which is, which is quite vulnerable, and also very specific threats. And social media doesn't always, even the companies, don't always react in the ways that that you would expect them to um, but but this insecurity is is almost like something that one has to live with all the time um, but it is linked to also an offline aspect of what is happening on the ground which is equally important and and deserves attention which is the way in which universities especially universities like JNU in Delhi or Jamia Millia Samia have been turned into battlegrounds uh, with the appointments deliberately of figures that are um, that, that that function with right explicit right wing ideologies, and with with the with the continued harassment, um, and detention, arrest, and um, of of students of student activists. So one prime a person whose whose name comes to mind immediately is Umar Khalid. Umar Khalid is a JNU student 
who uh, who has been he he uh, you know who was who completed his PhD at JNU he has been in prison now for over 500 days and the process is the punishment so very often uh, people in in universities who speak up will have cases uh, against them or will be if they are in India they might even be imprisoned and they would and that and that process just continues even even um, even without the charges being leveled explicitly against them so there's a there's a wide ranging process of uh, of the alteration of textbooks, selective use of history, reprisals against individuals, coordinated campaigns. And, and all of this really is so that uh, there can be a constant policing of what can be written, said, and read about this regime, uh, which functions in, in very explicitly anti-democratic ways. Um, now, just to add that, uh, there, there are two specific things in, in relation to this that I want to mention, uh, points of, of how this strategy works for the Hindutva ideology. One, there's the use of what are called IT cells, very similar to what we were just listening, uh, you know, what was just spoken about in the Chinese case, the, the 50 centers. So this idea of explicit idea of BJP IT cells, uh, that, and um, and the reason one knows that, of course, there's, there's research that I've cited in my papers, including a recent paper on misogyny, that uh, that these, these cells exist, uh, and, and that there are coordinated online Twitter responses that uh, that reference the exact same text by multiple individuals in response to any policy announcement and and also coordinated uh, coordinated ways of attacking people who 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 dissent uh, there is the securitization of dissent and the othering of of anyone who's not a normative hindu person is very very central to the hindutva project the other uh, the other point to mention here is the role of whatsapp Again, there's research in, in recent years on Indian uh, on the use of WhatsApp in, in Indian political context, uh, which and, and the term for that is almost that has come to be understood as the WhatsApp university. So the nature of facts in a very kind of Hannah Arendt sense, the nature of facts doesn't matter. The fact that something is true or false doesn't matter. The circulation or the systematic circulation of information on WhatsApp has become has become this this um, Assist a, a vehicle for the transmission of this ideology to large numbers of people who who have this as a as an important source of information. Uh, there is a, a widespread uh, there is widespread media censorship, uh, not always explicit, but also often implicit, uh, and the use strategic use of silence uh, by governmental figures in response to explicit genocidal calls that are made, uh, like the recent one that was made in in Haridwar in in, an, in a city in Uttar Pradesh in in India in India, and uh, there's there's no condemnation of of things like that. Um, there's, there's the use of diaspora, again, in very systematic ways, the use of diaspora activism, where Hindutva is repurposed to present a certain idea of Hindu Hinduism along the lines of spirituality, yoga, and spectacle, uh, but not, uh, but, but, um, but very selectively, of course. And, um, and I think that the, the very last thing that I want to point out is that this is not just, uh, there is, uh, there's an element of, you know, of online, of people doing this online, but there's also a lot of very systematic coordination. Uh, so last year, there was a report uh, that was uh, a report on of the group of ministers on government communication in India in December 2020, sorry, not last year, a year and a half ago, uh, which explicitly suggested that the right wing parties of other countries need to be roped in to find common ground. And there were suggestions at this meeting of, of uh, you know, of, of government ministers that there be the color coding of journalists along the lines of whether they were pro the regime, anti the regime or fence sitters. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the top 50 positive and negative influencers about the regime should be explicitly tracked. So this is a, is a very systematic project. And the more that uh, academic institutions and organizations overseas globally get to know about this, uh, the, the, the better academics like myself and others will be served. Uh, and, and especially that would also uh, be very vital uh, for the, you know, for, for the life, literally for the life and, and security and, and sustenance of people in, in, in places like India who are, who are actually facing the, the brunt of this. Thank you.